Uh, I certainly think it's worth looking at, but uh, if the question is what are the prospects for a, um, yes. payment in lieu of taxes for universities is a proposal that's been kicking around for at least 20 years. And um, the fact that it's never been approved makes me think that it's not high on the list for getting approved this year. Uh, the universities will push back very hard, pointing out all of the services that they provide to uh, communities um, that uh, they believe are, are benefits to the communities. Um, for instance, uh, some of the universities, their law schools have um, uh, provide students and legal services to the community uh, free of charge. Um, some, of the, some of the universities do research free of charge. I'm just pointing out what they will argue. The, um, I've never quite understood how you legislate a payment in lieu of tax and it's not a tax, but that's kind of beside the point. The, um, I think in terms of what's likely to happen in the short term, uh, I don't see it happening. I mean, I'll tell you, I remember dealing with this issue of pilots in the early 90s. At the same time, we were looking at trying to tax the uh, what are called government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae. Um, I mean, it's pretty outrageous that Fannie Mae pays no tax. It pays property tax, I believe, to the district, but it pays no... Sure. Yeah. They, they, they don't own that does. building. They lease that building. No, they do. They, they own it? At 3,900 Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah and I believe they pay taxes, too, on it. They pay real property taxes, but they don't pay income taxes. Uh, when they're, when they're actually operating legitimately and earning legitimate income, they get a lot of money, uh, but they don't pay any tax on that, although others that are involved with the mortgage business, uh, mortgage industry, do pay taxes. Um, we've never been able to tax them. That requires a congressional action, though. So I, um, I, I do want to say, so I wanted to say something in response to, uh, and maybe not so much in response, but to just kind of show how the, the, um, the issue of taxing gets a little bit more complicated. Dry cleaners. <coughs> For I do know that dry cleaners tax because I see it on my bill. It's not a lot of money. I remember for years my dry cleaner would ask me, when is the council going to repeal the sales tax? For some reason, businesses find these sales taxes to be very objectionable. A question though, well, but you know, maybe it suggests that there's a burden on the business. Mm -hmm. And if there's a burden on the business, maybe there's another way to get income from them, like looking at the corporate tax rate. Now, I'm not arguing against you right now, I'm just trying to say the picture gets a little bit more complicated. Um, what's really good about the sales tax, which is a regressive tax, is that it's a way of getting at non-residents. I'm not sure taxing dry cleaners gets at non-residents, but some of the other sales taxes do get at non-residents. Um, so that's just something else to keep in mind, and it's a problem with our taxing structure in the district, is that Often we have to look at taxes to get at non-residents. So the gross receipts tax is high because the federal government pays the gross receipts tax. Mm -hmm. If it's the gross receipts tax on our telephone bill, which I don't like paying, the fact is the federal government pays it as well, and that's a good thing. Right. So we often have to look at taxes in terms of how do we get at non-residents. Uh, yes, John. And, well, and I want to... You know, I was involved with the Fannie Mae thing, so I could back up on oh, that. Yes. Their excuse was always You're that they, uh, Yes, and they did say they paid property taxes if they were doing us a big favor, owning the land and paying it, just like anybody else who would own the land. And they always threatened to move out of the city, saying that we'll, you know, we'll take our jobs out of the city if they leave. Of course, they did that. They moved to rest mostly anyway, so it's not like they lived up to any promise. And then finally, if anybody bought that building and they left, well, then they'd be paying property tax and income tax, and et cetera. So um, that's what ended up happening. So, but with the parking tax, you mentioned that, and that's one that I, the reason I want to bring that up is because environmentalists have not really been fired up about this issue as much as I would expect they would be, because if we increase the parking tax, obviously we're incentivizing people to drive less. Well, the fact is that, you know, Bud Doggett and Dominic Antonelli died in the last couple of years, I guess. But the fact is, this is like the third rail of D.C. politics that since 1990, this tax has never been raised. Every time it gets threatened to be raised, they raise the parking meters instead, in essence, generating the same revenue. 
but what that does is just generate more business for the parking garage owners because then people flock to the garage. And so I, I don't know what it's going to take politically to change that, but obviously with $2,000 or $1,000 contribution limits, that's what's driving this policy. It's really not related to taxes, and it's really, really not related to priorities. So I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but it's just one that you mentioned, and I really think it's one that we should raise revenue on. It, it does hit computers. I mean, uh, we want to give an exemption to people who live in the city and pay a higher parking tax, and we can do that as part of the legislation. Yeah, if you raise the parking tax from 12% to 18%, it raises, you know, like around $13 million. Wow. Yeah, we actually recommended that in our Green Scissors report back in 2004. And still not an idea that's been acted on to any extent. Mm -hmm. Paul. This has been really interesting, and I, I, I appreciate all your good comments. One, two issues I wanted to raise. Um, one is a bottle bill. Uh, having lived a long time in, in one of the 10 or 11 states that have deposit laws on cans, bottles, and plastics, uh, it works very well and, in fact, raises quite a bit of revenue for the state. Uh, largely because, unfortunately, a lot of people don't return their bottles and cans. But it still, it, it, for them, from the environmental perspective, increases the voluntary rate that we get in the district and other places of 20 to 25 or maybe even 30 percent, up to close to 90 percent recycling. So it keeps enormous waste out of landfills. And secondly, it's really not a tax because if you're serious about it, you bring your bottles and cans back and get your money back. And it's, it's very straightforward. But the people who don't, of course, raise revenue then for the state or the district, I think it's something that really should be looked at. Would meet the needs of the environmental community, uh, landfill, waste management community, uh, and also revenue uh, for the for the district. The the uh, so I'd like your thoughts on that. The um, and we're we're discussing it internally as to whether in fact we've done a, a great report five years ago on, on voluntary versus deposit <coughs> laws, and we'll be, happy, we'll be happy to share that with you if you want. Called the Bear Report: Businesses and Environmentalists Allied for Recycling. Um, secondly, uh, something that's been in, in the news lately is the is um, the mayor's and uh, Kwame Brown's SUVs. Now I realize in the grand scheme of things this is a small amount of money, but when I read in the Washington Post that in fact this there's, there's an expense, monthly expense of something like eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars a month for an automobile, you know, we all know a lot of this is around symbolism. And if you're asking the district residents and all of us to pay higher taxes, to save money, be efficient if you're trying to support the environment, you just cannot allow these old symbols of capitalism Power. you know, all sorts of, and, and Marion Barry type politics to run rampant. And I'm wondering what the council can do, in fact, to prohibit this. Uh, you know, we've, we've had this case in other states I've lived in. I live in, probably in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we've had a mayor in Cambridge, unfortunately, follow this, and he got all hell broke loose when he did something like this. And we also have a new governor in the state of Massachusetts who also did the same thing to all of our surprise, and he immediately reversed course and realized this was bad publicity and very bad politics. So whether you can limit those expenses, uh, you know, they need to drive a Prius, they need to ride a bicycle, they need to drive a smart car like I think Mayor Fenty did. We do not need big black Escalade SUVs being shown up as, as some sort of boss politics in the city council. It just, it helps, it hurts all of us in trying to manage this sort of budget issue. I'll get off my high house there, sorry. You were doing well until you mentioned Mayor Fenty and the smart car. Yeah, I... Yeah. Because uh, he had the smart car, yes. Never that. And the city owned it, as opposed to lease it, yes. It was one of two cars. He drove his Lincoln Navigator SUV to and from City Hall. That's, that's good to know. Never okay. Okay. So, yeah. but that needs I don't to be think there's a lot of that symbolism. But, but what can be done? Well, the, the law right now... That has to be stopped. The law right now prohibits the purchasing or leasing of SUVs and vehicles under 22 miles per gallon, except for security. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, and the ones that have been in the news don't meet the exceptions, other than, I think, the mayor's car. Um, personally, if I was mayor, I wouldn't be driving an SUV or have an SUV. But um, that one is leased to MPD. And um, so the, the law's on the books. I don't know what we can do to prohibit it when it's a law that prohibits it, but we can have more <laughs> oversight, and I think the controversy right now has brought that oversight. <coughs> and we're going to see uh, more compliance with the law. Um, but, you know, I agree with you on the point about the symbolism. Yeah. Uh, the symbolism is difficult, though, okay. in, the sense of, in this sense. Um, you know, when we're asking people to cut, we ought not to be doing the tax abatements. I look at Ed, because he and I... 
we kind of echo each other on that. But it's not like that's going to get us four hundred million dollars. The um, but the symbolism is important. On the other hand, uh, I think sometimes we get too carried away with symbolism, and then we forget that you know we really need to be dealing with the meat, the substance that addresses the issue. Uh, with regard to the um, bottle pill, I, d I don't know what the prospects are for that. The, um, I, I don't know that that's a solution to this year's budget. Probably not. So you know maybe it fits into the debate because this is a good time when people are thinking about it. But you know, we had an initiative back in 1988, I believe, and it went down, and it has poisoned the ability to do a bottle bill ever since. Whether 20 years later we we're past that, I don't know. Um, we won the plastic bag bill. Yeah. Vis-a-vis right. -vis the plastic industry, the plastic bag bill was a victory. Yes, it was. So maybe that can be built upon. Maybe. Maybe. So this might be the right context for that discussion, but in terms of actually uh, addressing the um, three, four hundred million dollars that's still left to be dealt with, I don't think it will. I'm going to have to leave in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, Nina, you had asked yeah, before. I was just wondering in terms of uh, life cycle budgeting for uh, bringing down the, the district's operating costs over time um, on, uh, let's say, building management and so on. Uh, fleet management is another one, of course, um, where the original investments, the capital upfront capital costs are onerous, especially since we've, I guess, we've maxed out on our bonding capacities, especially in the face of our shaky bond uh, uh, standing right now. But um, in terms of lease agreements or lease, you know, the very, actually, Mike's company is involved in this kind of uh, payment plan, but different financing options, public-private financing options. Um, traditionally, the, from what I understand, the city um, and the mayor's office have been very much dead set against engaging, and there might be legal frameworks that make it difficult also for the, for the district's, uh, district government to engage in, in um, financing plans that involve um, being beholden to private firms uh, for, let's say, installing uh, HVAC systems, uh, renewable systems, district energy systems, uh, greening the schools, uh, taking advantage of this incredible schools infrastructural renewal that we're doing, um, which could be way, way, way further optimized by greening them much more in terms of the life cycle budget costs of operating those schools, which would be a demonstrated savings in, an, in the foreseeable future. So um, we're not talking about 2012 here, but we are because uh, we could be making uh, perhaps uh, opening up our, our – um, our regulatory and legislative frameworks to allow some financing mechanisms to put into place these these uh, systems, environmentally sound systems that could incur okay. very are major you savings. About, like capital borrowing in order to acquire a more energy efficient boiler, let's say? Could be. Or are you talking about that. hiring a company that will do the boiler and then share the saving? Could be. Okay. There, there well, are. They're all a function of whether the district's property management is aggressive and intelligent in pursuing those options. That's really all that's missing. I don't think there are prohibitions on any of those strategies. It's a function of finding a strategy that actually works and wanting to find a strategy that actually works. You know, the Office of Property Management, uh, six years ago under Tony Williams, was interested in green roofs and looking at <coughs> getting green roofs on buildings. As far as I know, the Office of Property Management the last four years could care less about green roofs. That's not a function of can we do it, it's the attitude and mindset of okay. the agency. And then there's also the question of siloed, the way the agencies are siloed now, which, which all agencies have been, and getting the cross-silo efficiencies. Um, so from your point of from what you understand, it's, there are no legislative obstacles. Uh, well, it's there a, might be some, some or minor. It, it depends on what the proposal is. Okay. You know, in the area of utilities, uh, we had to legislate to allow reverse auction for acquiring um, energy. Right. Uh, we had to legislate it. And you did. But the energy office had to come up with the idea. Right. Okay. 
I wasn't sure who was first of the two. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is real quick, but it, it really kind of goes, this actually brings up a, a, a question about how efficient are we as a, as a government? I mean, I, I've lived in D.C. since 92, and it seems like we've always had a reputation for being very inefficient. And how do we shift that culture? Um, Thank I mean, you. DDOT with its street lighting wastes tremendous amounts of energy. Um, and those are relative, there's some relatively simple fixes there. I mean, Parks and Rec left the lights on at Jefferson for four days solid, you know, field lights that, you know, and they were doing it at Howard and all over the place. So we're, how do we shift that culture? And I think that that, that is really, you know, where people aren't, ha where district employees are not satisfied with the status quo and encouraged to find solutions. Do you want to follow up on that? Yeah. Um, Ms. Mendelson left, but to what she said, I know that Mr. Mendelson serves with the public safety. And I know for a fact that the latest of the 911 call takers who were hired in December 2008 are still almost three years later term employees. So they don't have a guaranteed job. Mm -hmm. um, this time last week, um, in fact it was Tuesday I want to say, 911 had two call takers on a nighttime shift. So I've heard the conversation about priorities mm -hmm. and even in regards to places where cuts have been made in hopes of looking to um, save money and generate revenue. But my question is, because I also heard this from Biddle when I was at his open house last week, the conversation about priorities in a public forum has not been had. So I wanted to know, if I sent you an invitation, and I was going to ask Mendelssohn as well, as well as Mr. Lazier, everyone on the panel, to come and have that conversation, because I've invited Biddle as well, would you all come? So I, I've said yes to every single invitation I've received to talk about the budget. I was at the Fair Budget Coalition yesterday. And I would be happy to come to uh, any event that you would invite me to. Um, now, in terms of talking about the priorities from a council perspective, um, we are going to have, uh, you know, the council has 30, 40, 50 hearings, you know, regarding the, the, the budget. You know, each, each individual agency, the budget as a whole, um, both at the beginning of the process and at the end of the process. So there are, you know, many opportunities to put you know, um, to, to, to talk about what the various priorities are of the district or of your organization. Thank you. Hey, Brent, you raised your hand a long time ago. I didn't no, want to, but you're okay? Okay. I'm okay, but uh, here's now that Go you followed me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, do you remember um, that the owners of buildings in D.C. got the council to waive the tax they would normally pay because they said it's all clean water, we're just sending it to the sewer system, and we shouldn't pay because it's not dirty water, it's not for sewer or gray water or whatever. Well, with that, that plant, it costs money to process it. It overloads the plant or it pushes it up on the limits. We ought to, isn't that one that we ought to get back? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, that's in our Green Scissors report. That's another one. I mentioned the parking tax. We well, should just reissue the, 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 the old report. Chris, what's it called? Which is a storm? Uh, it was a, it's a water collects underneath buildings, and 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 in the old days, well, they we have a sump pump, pump and it pumps it into the sewer system. Yeah. And Mayor Fenty was able to get a fee applied to that, that uh, to, to, for the honor of pumping it into our our system, and and then a Aoba. Mm -hmm. got busy and they, they never liked that and they were so proud of themselves and they, when they repealed it uh, some years ago and uh, that's been one of my pet peeves I want to bring that back thank you for bringing it up yeah, that that's was actually another thing. Thing. well speaking of laws that have been repealed um, I used to be a council staff person and drafted a law that was passed called the Clean Air Compliance Fee Act and what that did is it charged a parking sales tax on people who park for free you know, you only pay the parking sales tax if you, there's a commercial transaction. And there are a lot of commuter parkers who get their parking space for free as a perk. It's included in the lease. You know, the law firm gets X number of spaces. Mm -hmm. So there's no commercial transaction, therefore there's no parking sales tax collected. So I drafted a law that was enacted in 1994 or 5 that would put, I think it was a, at that time, it was a $20 a month uh, fee on parking spaces that were used for commuting, so not for retail, not for residential, but spaces that were used for home-to-work parking, but which didn't collect the parking sales tax. 
And a conservatively estimate was that would raise about $12 million at that time. And that was a very conservative estimate because that only included federal government spaces um, and did not include the spaces that are allocated to law firms, universities, hospitals, etc. Again, as opposed to raising the existing sales tax, which you could say, well, it creates competitive problems with the suburbs or this, that, and the other thing. Here, we're just creating a level playing field. Well, you know, everybody else is paying a parking sales tax. You're parking for free, you know, paying $20 a month or whatever you want to make. Now, it still can't be seen as onerous. And it was passed? It was passed. Congress, uh, Congressman Davis, I believe, uh, prevented the mayor, said bad things will happen if you try to implement it, and then it was repealed uh, when the control board was created. Okay. A little small paragraph at the back. <laughs> I believe there was legislation introduced in the last two to four years, maybe by Jim Graham or Tommy Wells, to do something they very similar. They talked about it, but they had, well, well I know. It didn't pass, it didn't, I know that. They didn't have hearings on it. Yeah, it didn't move very far. But, uh, I think that's something to think about. Mike and then Irv. Yeah. Um, this is a little... As brief as possible my... because we're, we're running out of time. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, so I, uh, I lived in London for a little while, and, you know, they have the, uh, the tax uh, to uh, any the citizen. The, the traffic tax. tax. Yeah, and, and, and not necessarily talking politically because maybe Congress would ask that idea too, but have you guys ever looked at that as a... Uh, potential tax? Reducing. People have talked to me about it, that's for sure. Um, even, you know, friends of mine who are like Republican staffers on the Hill working on transportation issues have, have, have talked to me about that. Supportively? Um, pardon? The Republicans have talked to you supportively yeah. about it? Yeah, I mean, it's my good friend who's a Republican who works on transportation issues. He's like, oh, you should do this. I'm like, but it's a um, private conversation. Yeah, it's not exactly. No, as a, as a, as a, as a <laughs> private I, conversation. I, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I think. Realistically, it's just not something that we can do because if you think about it, like at a meta level, you know, it's it's about the American people having access to the seat of government, you know, and if you and if you charge for access to Washington D.C., you could be prohibiting people from access to their elected representation. I used if to you, work at DDOT. Yeah. If people want to talk to me about this afterwards, I can yeah. talk a lot. The, the, the London framework is a climate framework. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it's, it, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, so if we had climate legislation and this were one of the enforcing mechanisms you know, from a pollution standpoint, mm -hmm. I think we'd have more to go on. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Now, one thing I wanted to do really quickly, because we're all, I, I wanted to go go around and and maybe there's four or five people that have a specific issue that that's of concern for us right now in terms of the budget, and maybe just for folks to hear it. I'm not quite sure it's something you could necessarily respond to specifically, but I, uh, but maybe um, and you'll get the idea when when. Um, Irv starts off, starts this off, because I know what he's going to say. Well, this topic is how does D.C. budget shortfalls can hurt the environment. And one thing that came up recently, and there's a rumor going about, if you, as you probably well know, about $7.5 million has been awarded to the city by CSX for offenses uh, related to the Anacostia River, dumping of coal and other issues. I'm hearing that, well, that money was supposed to be allocated towards restoration of the Anacostia River. But I'm hearing that it may be going into the general fund. Uh, sounds like what happened when the bag uh, uh, proceeds were being tapped in to go into the general fund. Are we are we expecting that? Is there any discussion seriously about that? Or we, we need to have the monies in the river. It's not enough to clean up the river and the issues along it. I'm not aware. I'll look into it. I can, I can, I can speak very briefly oh, to okay. that. It's my understanding that the, uh, the consent decree that uh, DDOE got approved with CSX, um, which becomes a court order in which we have to obey. Specifically, requires there's I think it's about eight or eight point five million to be spent on a brownfields uh, revitalization program. Um, so DDOE wants to start that up because they never got to even the brownfields all these past years ago. Um, they never had the funding to actually start this and to go out and actually make people you know a mini super fund sort of thing to make people clean up these polluted sites, especially along the Anacostia. Um, Vicki Corman, who was uh, the general counsel of DOE, but who since left, she uh, made very sure, from what I understand, it was an agreement to limit that so that we'd be stuck with that court order and they, they couldn't be removed to the general fund. Great. Other issues? Thank you. Uh, well, actually, you've spoken. Um, anyone <coughs> hasn't spoken yet? 
All right, we'll go back to Rick, but be brief. Very briefly, um, because of the budget situation, if somebody came to you and said, great idea, how about a 10 to 20 percent sales tax on construction, labor, and materials, I think everybody would say, oh, that's a terrible idea because construction buildings are already too expensive. This would really depress construction business, reduce jobs, make it harder for people to weatherize and solarize the buildings without realizing that our existing property tax does that. It's only a 1 or 2 percent tax on value, but unlike the sales tax, which you pay once, the tax on property you pay every year that it adds value to the property. If you do mm -hmm. that present value calculus, it's like a 10 to 20 percent sales tax. The property tax in some cities has been transformed by shifting the tax off of buildings onto land. We could collect the same revenue, but do so in a way that would incentivize jobs, building maintenance, and construction. I think be a real positive for the city. I'd like to talk to you That's about That's in the Green Cities Report, too. Okay. So, in fact, you authored that section. The only thing I would say is that um, everybody saw, or most people probably saw the Post article the other day with the solar stuff, and um, and then there was the hearing yesterday, which was on a separate issue, which is the solar renewable energy credits. And um, I, I just wanted to make that clarification that the, the solar industry uh, actually does want to move away from those publicly funded REIP-type programs and move towards a very stable uh, SREC uh, RPS program that, that doesn't require uh, public uh, dollars and dollars from the budget. And other organizations, too, okay. are, want, want that stability. Right. Yeah, yeah, but so I can't just speak all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul, uh, Paul did I, you say? Yeah, I, I did. I mentioned very briefly, we've had, a, we've had a quarter million dollars in the budget, maybe you, Chris, know which year, or Nan on the phone may, for a uh, follow-up epidemiological study on uh, toxic agents remaining in Spring Valley from the the World War One burial of chemical weapons. It's a big issue in Spring Valley, very important, and I'm just hoping that that quarter million has either been already contracted with Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. It should have been. Or it was in the works before I left. Was it? Okay, so it may not be threatened. We can check on it. Yeah, be good to, I'm just hoping it's not threatened in any way. We need, we need that and more. It should be obligated already. Okay, great. My point is a little more general. Um, our office is on H Street Northeast, and you know there's a lot of work going on, and the um, I, I would just uh, uh, recommend an emphasis on green infrastructure and transportation is a big part of it. The, uh, uh, the trolley line, which will connect with, uh, uh, with the boards on the other side of the river. Um, I'm, I, I think that something that has not been really looked at is uh, how do you raise revenue in a city where you have an enormous amount of a population well below you know, the, uh, the, 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 the average income level? Um, and these are ways that, um, that I think can, can encourage that. And so I think these are worthwhile investments for the sake of the city government and its ability to provide services as well as the residents of the city. So I, I really don't want that to be lost in the equation that um, things like a trolley is, uh, is, um, um, is a luxury. And, uh, I, think, I think streetcars is, my background is economic development, I think streetcars are corridor-wide economic development mm -hmm. instead of piecemeal economic development the way we often do it through tax abatements and tips mm -hmm. that, that benefit like one or two entities as opposed to something like streetcars that, mm -hmm. you know, benefit everyone along the route. Exactly. Including local entities. Although I met, I met with some transportation experts a while ago and, and they're saying that, okay, we've already had these, these certain lines are, are, mm -hmm. are planned, but they, they actually may not be the optimum design for, for a system that really integrates properly. And anything in the future really has to be a little better plan, uh, a little more. Um, That's true. Yeah. But when the planning is done, it's then 20 years before it's implemented right, right, right. and the technology <laughs> is yeah. advanced. We're always going to be behind and we can always choose not to do something because there's something better in the future. Jeff. Um, I'm not sure who is replacing Alan Liu at Ocuffin, um, but Holly Harper. Okay, I think it's really important that their commitment to lead silver in the modernization, and not only kids learn better and they're healthier, but they save so much money in operating, which is a huge chunk of the school you know, budget. So I just hope that, I'm not sure who to, who to push on that, but you know, that, that's just a no-brainer. I, I, that's actually where that first cost versus life cycle analysis really comes in, because it may be a slightly, slightly more, it doesn't have to really cost more to do green buildings. No. But not much. if you look at that first cost and then the lifetime savings that that building would create mm -hmm. done in an efficient way, it's, that, that really needs to
needs to come into the calculus. And right. then if you throw in asthma, public health costs into yeah. the lot, mm -hmm. then you get a really major. Well, I mean, a lot of it is just is just managing the construction process well. Right. Um, the the and design. Chairman Chairman Brown did a hearing yesterday on OPEFM and and went over some of the costs of of some of the modernizations. And you look at a building like School Without Walls that costs like something like five hundred eighty dollars a square foot, and it didn't I don't, didn't think it had a, any sort of lead certification. Um, and then you looked at something like um, Sidwell Friends, which the district didn't do, but that was, you know, a lead platinum building, and that was something like $380 per square foot. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, that was lead platinum, and, and, and he made that point very clear that you have something that should have, in all accounts, been more expensive, but, you know, the private sector did it a lot more cheaply, cheaply than, you know, what the district did, and why is this happening, and we need to, you know, better manage our dollars so that, you know, the modernizations are good and they do have lead certification. And a lot of that goes back to what we were talking about, I was talking about earlier, about culture shift. Because if you're used to doing buildings in a certain way and you've got your mm -hmm. construction project mm -hmm. managers are used to doing mm -hmm. it, safe, they get the contracts out to the same guys because they've always worked with them, then you're never going to have change. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so, you know, it's all, it's all tied together and we have to figure that one out. I, I think that's... Thank you so much. This is uh, an excellent. It's, it's, we're always challenged by time with these present. With them. But I thought it was we got a basic un, uh, budgetary understanding. Where we're at, and we threw some ideas around. That's pretty good, actually. For, we, we go to a lot of these luncheons. And the DC Environmental Network. One of our priority uh, issues is to deal with the budget. The last two budget cycles, we have been very busy, very um, trying to figure out what our priorities are, and then trying to communicate that with decision makers. So, um, so you'll hear more from us on this. This is a good step one as we move into the budget cycle. Thanks for coming. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you.